Turn for another edition of Saturday with Seniors. Big thank you to our longtime sponsor, Eisenhower's Tiger County Harley Davidson. And we are heading into the riding season as your bike tuned up, ready to go, need some accessories, any work done. Now's the time to do it at Eisenhower's South Mansfield. And we have uh, Don Norman joining us here from Liberty. And we're going to be talking about farming and about life and Liberty and big family of nine kids. And how are you today? Very good. Good morning. You seem to be in great shape. And when you told me your age, I was like, how'd you pull that off? (laughs) I am 76. Seven, typical war baby, born in 1946. You know, large class of kids that we still are close together and get together. Well, even this Saturday for breakfast. And, mm-hmm. you know, it was a, a great time because all my classmates were also farm kids and struggling to survive. And so we had a lot in common. So how long has your family, the Norman family, been in Tower County in this area? Well, the Normans came in from England, Somersetshire, with the coal industry in Arnott. And my great-grandfather got miner's lung, and so he moved over to Liberty with his family, and they uh, lived there. Uh, and at that time, it was very common to grow produce and take it into Arnott and sell it. And so that's what they did. And when he was young, he uh, was the only boy, so about a half mile from his home was a butcher shop. And he would uh, work at the butcher shop just for the off fall to take home to help feed the rest of the family. But one of the things they would do is uh, his horse and saddle bag, he'd fill up with meat and he'd go over the mountain to Arnott and pedal door to door selling the meat to the miners. Wow. Yeah, but imagine the permits you would need now to do something <laughs> like that versus just, hey, let's just put some meat in our pockets and go sell it in our bag. Yeah. I'm and, sure there's a little more to it than that. But. It, yeah, yeah, and you're I'm, absolutely right. But uh, I'm glad we do have those protections. But... The thing you have to remember, though, uh, you know, if you got bad meat or something, the whole neighborhood knew it, and the uh, it sort of pleased itself. If you had quality product, everybody mm-hmm. knew it. Yeah. It, it, it was it, a different age. That totally makes sense. So your parents were farmers before you were farmers? My grandfather uh, bought a farm. He was a logger and a portable sawmill. He was sawing the steep side hills off, and he bought the farm to feed the horses, and then later... My dad got into the dairy business. and So how long ago was that that your grandfather bought the farm? Do you uh, know? 1902. 120, whatever, yeah. three years ago, four years ago, yes. two years ago. Okay, long and, time. You know, you give some farmers some money, they uh, build another barn and stuff. And, uh, you know, in the roaring 20s, we had the war, in World War One in Ukraine and wiped out all them grain fields just like it has today. And so the uh, farmers made a lot of money. And both of my grandparents built new barns there and uh, one in 1923 and one in 1928 and you know and that that was part of what made the farming so tough later on is because of the money from the 20s and mm-hmm. they expanded and increased production and it later came and then back the great depression around. came around depression came around mm-hmm. farmers have always been thrifty when they have money they invested in something that's going to help them in the future as opposed to something that's going to make them happy at the moment yep uh, well, Far- i think the whole generation was then <laughs> yeah farmers like big barns <laughs> you know no doubt about it so uh, you had nine kids in your family yeah there were five boys and four girls and you know growing up on a farm with nine kids it's uh, very enjoyable you work together you know it was hard work but there was a lot of camaraderie and later on as i farmed you know you get on a tractor and you look down the field and it's a long way to the other end and then you turn around and come back and long hours in the barn and mm-hmm. you know it, you really miss that camaraderie that we had back in the early days days when everybody was working together and we actually like to try to outdo each other a little bit and <laughs> how very early did, did they have you start helping out in the farm with with actual chores and stuff was oh, this in the very early of ages yeah we lived in the barn you know as young kids and Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, we really preferred the barn and the fields to the house, yep. you know. So well, a school, uh, where'd you go to school? Uh, Nauvoo had... Uh, did your family have their own school bus? <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> in the early days, my older brothers and sisters walked to school in Butertown, but I went to Nauvoo and... It was so a Butertown very... Butertown had a school? Hold on a second. Oh, the, she, yeah, sure. I don't it, think... Too, Buter, I know the road is. I assume Butertown, yeah. somewhere down Butertown Road, it, off 414 the Liberty. The school is still there and renovated as a house. 
place. And my mother taught there, and that's how she ended up meeting my dad in Liberty, a long wow. ways from Mainsburg to Liberty, and that's how that huh. came about. That's but, fascinating. Uh, yeah. Yeah, my class in Nauvoo, we had three in each grade, and it was nice. Uh, we'd do some things with the other. I think there were seven in my class there, but we did a lot of things with the uh, whole group, like spelling bees and things like that. And it was nice to, as a younger person to sit there and listen to what the other classes, upperclassmen were talking about. And you actually learn well. And I consider my education in that three-room school as being very outstanding, you know. Yeah. A lot of people were in school rooms, aren't it? was like that, too, where it was one room and several grades in the same room. Yeah. And was it and, what he did? That, was this a coal? Was this your typical schoolhouse oh, with a coal stove or wood stove? You, or? you brought up another good subject because I that's my first job. I got 25 cents a week for taking care of the coal furnace. So in the morning, you'd come down stairs and clean out the ashes. So you were a and, student, you're saying, and your job was to take care of the coal furnace. Okay, yeah. There's another one that we probably wouldn't see today as far as the OSHA rules. <laughs> you're but, you're yeah. right. That, that would be, well, not only that I was unsupervised the mm-hmm. teacher didn't come down and yeah well you know and uh, mm-hmm. but no you grew up with fires in the home and you knew a lot about it and there's a lot of art and keeping a good uniform temperature in a Absolutely. school room and that 25 cents I don't know if it's it motivates have, you to do have it, it but it was <laughs> sure sure seemed like a lot of money at that time <laughs> so what grade were you in Nauvoo till was that uh, through six. elementary school or yeah, was that just through six yeah first through six and then where'd you attend school after that? Um, in downtown Liberty? Liberty? Liberty High School. The building is still there. It was uh, made with cinder block and steel frame windows. And uh, later on, as in school board, we put styrofoam on the outside and mm-hmm. epoxy and, you know, and put in new windows and stuff. But the building that I went to is still there. Well, let's it, talk about Nauvoo. What, was, what were classes like? What was the, what was the feeling? Describe it. Well, well, one of the things that we did very well is the geography, because you had those good quality paper charts up on the wall of the countries, and you know, and you talk about the different countries, and we had a very good sense of the world and geography. And nowadays, there's so many different countries and stuff, and I don't know that the children have as good a feel of the Mm -hmm. geography as we did back then but poetry was very important once a month we'd have to memorize a poem and stand up in front and when you think about the public relations there's a lot of students nowadays that have trouble talking in front of adults and things like that and the fact that you were forced to get up in front of the classroom and Mm -hmm. recite the poem once a month and the spelling bees were very much you know the attention's on you when you're trying to spell the word I remember that sweating down the face Everyone's going to laugh at me if I spell this wrong. (laughs) Right. You know, and so communication-wise, we had a very good background. But uh, especially, I appreciate the uh, stuff that we used to read uh, from New England poetry and good quality Mm -hmm. books at that time. And just the other day, I started to read a book, and I'm not going to tell you what it was, but I, I read the first chapter, and I thought, there's no child or teenager should ever read a book like this. And I threw it in the trash. You know, it's it's sad. Yeah, wow. Yeah, I did my part to mm-hmm. the world by destroying that book. Yeah, exactly. Material that just isn't appropriate for kids. Is, it's is not weird. appropriate. Yeah. Things have, have changed so, so much with that type of stuff. And, of course, no internet back then. Did you get any TV stations when you were growing well, up there? Well, we didn't have a television until I was about 11th grade. But That's why at, you turned out so great. <laughs> at the same, well, that's debatable. That's a big part of it. <laughs> that's debatable. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, the thing is, uh, there were only three channels at that time but in grade school I would have to listen to the other kids talking about what a great show they saw last night classics like Red Sullivan and yep. you know and that and they're all enjoying talking about it and we didn't have a television so so did your family listen to radio to get news at uh, yeah at we, we did and, or to, uh, yeah. but there again like I said we enjoyed farming mm-hmm. enjoyed that as a whole lifestyle we enjoyed the outdoors and the how was well, so sufficient were you with the farming did you have to buy well, a lot of groceries or did we were able we, to we were very self-sufficient and saturday mornings i'd ride out with the uh, milk truck and go door to door and uh, deliver chickens that had been butchered friday so on night. the milk truck you delivered chickens around the yeah, liberty area in the liberty area there were certain people that had ordered them ahead and yeah so that's sunday dinner you can't mm-hmm. beat that fresh delivered yep. chickens feathers still on them and everything or did you oh clean no them all? no okay. they were okay. well 
Okay. Well cleaned and I never had no, a chicken, you, whole chicken delivered, so no, I don't know how the process no, works. No, you, you take pride in that and yeah. like I said, it pleases itself and so no, you were very sensitive to mm-hmm. deliver a good quality product that they were happy with and ordered one the yep. next week or a couple weeks later. So yeah. when you were, we were a kid, was your family was finances kind of tight? Were you able to do some entertainment things or was it really no. find your own way to entertain? Finances were very tight and I hitchhiked to college. You know, there was a lot of hitchhiking and, when I talked to people. Yeah, I the, hitchhiked the to and from commented. college, and uh, yeah. you know, and I have a book of what I spent that first year at college, and it's a real joke when you see how little. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, money was tight, and I, it wasn't just me. I mean, it's all the all neighborhood. Around. Yeah, yeah. When I look at some of the other students that were in my class, and look at the farms they had, and yeah, it was self-sufficient. Otherwise, we wouldn't have been there. Yeah. How often then did your family go shopping or go into town? Where did you go to go grocery shopping if you need well, something to Liberty or to Bloss or we, we, uh, Dayton Smith Store was in downtown Liberty. There were two. That where Sam well, was there, in Bryant? No, or no. It, uh, it burnt down since then. There were actually three stores in Liberty. There were three uh, grocery stores in Liberty. Yeah, there's one where half the bank is Francis Roops and. Mm-hmm. And Bob Bryan came in later and another younger generation, but that's a long time ago. But yeah. Well, do you Bryan's remember downtown Liberty stuff. as a kid? Was it happening? Was, was there a lot of activity? We, and uh, we were talking about three stores and there, I, I think there was a hotel at one time, maybe before no, your time, not, but you know. Not a whole lot of activity no. in downtown Liberty, you know. Horses no. in town when you were a kid? Did you see them much? No? No, very, very little. But my grandfather had horses there in Mainsburg and it was such a wonderful thing for me to sit up on the bus board and they would pick corn by hand and throw it against the thing and I would hold the reins and pretend I was driving and I didn't realize that the horses answered to the verbal commands of grandpa. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was a big thing there. You five, thought you had the steering wheel. But four or five years old and mm-hmm. yeah and but they answered his vocal commands but I sat there on the front of the buckboard with the reins yeah. but that's one of my favorite uh, memories of horses. Yeah you've mentioned Mainsburg a few times so you spent some time up in Mainsburg and you've mentioned also every, that that's where one of the produce places was yeah, too. Every, uh, every other Sunday we went to visit Grandpa and Grandma. And he was a typical, very uh, tight English <laughs> Vermonter mm-hmm. type, uh, you know. And uh, I learned a lot because he read the ag magazines, the Rural New Yorker and uh, those early yep. magazines. And they had quality writers in those days that you learned a lot from them. And even as a potato grower, I really enjoyed what I learned from him. Even this morning, I read an article on the internet about growing potatoes. And my conclusion when I got done is my grandfather, 70 years ago, taught me everything that there was to know. That there is to know <laughs> about news been growing since. potatoes. I, I only picked up one item. And the guy that wrote this was a guy that raised the seed potatoes and really knew what he was doing. And he had everything that my grandpa taught me is still accurate today. So, uh, high school, you, you went to Liberty High School. And then yeah. when did you, you got married? I assume tell me about your family well as far as my family i went to penn state and mm-hmm. I, I met a girl from york county that her uh, dad was a tenant farmer mm-hmm. to begin with and so we have a lot in common that way as far as uh, we're both very tight with our money and she came from dairy farm background and so in uh, 77 we bought a farm back home i was away for 13 years before i came back but so what made you decide to come back after 13 years of being away from Tioga County? Well, I I had a good job, and the people that I worked with, was I was an engineer for New Holland Machine Company, and did the round. Baylor all came off my boards, and plus I was new market development, but one weekend I went deep sea fishing with a bunch of my friends, and they were very nice, uh, conservative type people from all over the country, Wisconsin, Michigan, you know, Pennsylvania, Virginia, and uh, when I saw how the teenagers acted, I felt like everything that was important to me was lost in one generation so my oldest daughter was uh, just going into second grade when we came home and bought the farm and uh, I did it mainly so that my family would get the same uh, conservative values that I grew up with you know 
What you get from being raised in Tioga County. <laughs> That's right. And, he, yes. and, he, and I see, you probably saw the other day that it's Tioga Potter is listed as one of the best destinations to come to mm -hmm. in Pennsylvania. And Absolutely. We have a lot to offer I here. chose to move here 28 years ago. Came and visited a <laughs> never, few times. and Never left. So that no, says it all. No, I've lived here more than any, all the other places I've lived my life combined. Right. So. <laughs> and my wife is the same. You yeah. know, she's been here since 77. And yeah. So how have you seen things change since you grew up? You, you know, like in the farming industry, there's definitely been some changes is it harder for a farmer these days easier different uh, uh what have you, you know well, what have you I, seen evolve i guess the best when i bought my farm in 77 someone told me that the most important thing wasn't my crops and everything else it's understanding the government programs and taking advantage of them and that really wasn't what i wanted to hear you know i have take pride in yeah. what I grow and my, especially mm -hmm. my soil and all that stuff. And, you know, so I guess that's one of the big changes nowadays is uh, the government is very much involved and you better know what their regulations are, but there's a lot of grants out there and things that help one farmer and not the neighbor. And, you know, it's, it's an interesting thing nowadays, but the big thing in Tioga County, uh, at one time, Liberty had the largest powder milk plant east of the Mississippi river. And uh, you were telling me that. That you know, old milk plant now, building south of Liberty. Yeah, right. That, in it doesn't town, look that big, but I guess it doesn't have to be that big to be the biggest. No, that's right. It has to do with throughput and how much goes in and out each mm -hmm. day. And so the farmers down in Rose Valley and Jersey Shore and all different areas came into there. And uh, the other thing I guess it says is how small the rest of the milk plants are mm -hmm. east of the Mississippi. You know. <laughs> yep. But the dairy business has been so sad. And what happened there? Uh, the New York farmers have taken over our market here. For instance, they don't take Pennsylvania members in one of the co-ops that bought Valley Farms. So the milk going into there is all New York. And what they did years ago, one of the co-ops had borrowed money from the government. It had good plans when they did it. But they turned around and loaned that money back to a processor for exclusive rights in the plant. And that was here in Tioga County. So that was the development where the New York State milk started to flow down here. And some of our local co-ops were more busy in sending milk to Georgia and Virginia and places like that to get a little extra money. And they didn't take care of their local processors. And so sometimes uh, short-run smarts don't always end up as being long-term wise. Totally makes sense. And uh, sad to hear that that's happened. You know, you drive by and you see these old, I don't know if you feel the same way you see an old farm and you look at it and it's starting to grow in with those briars. And it's, the barn's got a hole in the roof. It's and sad. And you think about the memories that were there. And sure. And myself as well. I uh, My main barn was built in 1860. And it hurt. It would have cost me uh, probably 70, 80,000 to fix it up. And then 25 years, I'd have to fix it up. And, you know, where's the cash flow in doing that? So my barn was disassembled. And it's up in uh, Woodstock, Vermont now as a fancy tourist wood shop. And I ended up taking the money that I would have put into the renovation of the old barn and built something that's more functional for me. Yep, that's looking it's forward. Still a business that's got to make ends meet. So it's got a cash flow. Yeah. So what do you see the future of farming in Tioga County? What do you think in well, ten years, twenty years, it will still be going one way or your shape, or where oh, do you think it's going to take off? Absolutely. And I've uh, since uh, I was involved in helping get the Farm Preservation Board established years ago in Tioga County, we have preserved a lot of farms in Tioga County already along the Route 49 corridor mm -hmm. up there. There's, there's a lot of preserved farms and Welsh settlement. We've got a nice big block there that we've preserved in the Welsh settlement. And when right you say now, preserved, like are there funds to protect the farm to be there, or yeah, yeah. you, you yeah. have to keep the as, as the, the owner agreed to into a program yeah. that allow protect and, it. And the nice thing, the, the, the agreed is a good word, Kevin, because what we have here is uh, the farmer himself makes the decision to sell the development rights. It's not some government program mm -hmm. coming down. It is choice by the farmer, and, and my farm is preserved. So it's nice to look out the window and see the fields below me and know that those pastures and stuff will continue to be there. And, For generations to come, that's great but that you did that. If you look at trends, there are a lot of farmers that have went to beef cattle, dairy. It was a nice, easy transition. But I, I've been in the dairy and beef and sheep business. And, you know, we're going, I think 
we're going to continue to see a growth in some of the sheep, goats, and pigs, of course, is everywhere. We, mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, uh, There's more swine in Tyler County than there are people. Yeah. Uh, when I added which, it up, which it like the three biggest farms almost come up with a 40, a, few, a few years ago, you should, could have said the same about dairy cattle, and that's not true anymore. But at the same time, the consumption of pork is down, and the production numbers of pork is way up. So, you know, like mm-hmm. everything else, it's... Uh, you could drop the price pretty fast it, if that gonna, doesn't balance out. Well, it's good for me because I like those pork loins. And, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, the end user, but... <laughs> and everybody loves bacon, you know, so... That's not going to go out of style too fast. But, you know, I have to say that it's going to taper off here in the hog business. But I do see a lot of people and that you wouldn't expect that are putting in a few goats and sheep and after a while they have a few more. And see, and what happened there, uh, this goes clear back to when Bill Clinton was president. They started raising the grazing rights on the federal lands and it's at the point where the sheep people out there in Montana and that can't afford to pay the grazing rights. And so that's pushing the mm-hmm. sheep and goat market east. And if you look at the map of where the growth is, it's all outside the normal corridor where the grazing rights and large numbers of sheep originally were. And they, they just uh, want to preserve the environment a little bit more for the elk and deer and that stuff and tourists. Yeah, well, <laughs> they got to feed them too sometimes. Yeah. So. <laughs> we all need food. Very interesting. Anything else you want to talk about? We got a couple more minutes, but. No, I think that's a pretty good session, Kevin. Okay. I don't know. Appreciate it. It's been very interesting learning uh, about your history and about liberty and about farming and big families. And uh, <laughs> what do you think? Is this world going to eventually, we're going to realize I, that we need to go back to some of the I, basics? The, we, we absolutely do. It's, it's a pendulum. And even yesterday on the, the news, they did a survey of the Gen Z. And even though you're talking about the texting and the internet and all that stuff, there is a revival amongst them to come back a little more to Christian values and conservative values. And with all the things happening in the world, I think we'll see the pendulum swing. All right. I hope so. We'll see where it goes. Yeah. Sometimes it takes people getting annoyed enough or they're going all the way to one direction to say, you know what, <laughs> to make the obvious obvious. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Don uh, Norman, joining us here, uh, born in 1946 from Liberty. And if you missed any of today's show, of course, you can tune into all the previous shows through our website, kc101fm.com. You'll find our YouTube channel link, and there's about 50 of these interviews on there. And uh, there you go. Brought to you by Eisenhower's Tyler County, Harley-Davidson, South Mansfield. Riding season's near. 